Welcome to another Deep Dive. And uh, today we're going to be talking about a legendary diamond. Ooh. The great star of Africa. I love this one. I know. And we've got so many interesting sources. Yes. Historical records and biographical accounts. Mm. Even some news articles that we're going to be looking at. Right. And um, basically, you know, we're going to be talking about yeah. a journey that starts in South African mines and ends up oh. with... British royalty. It's a good one. With a little bit of controversy yeah. along the way. Absolutely. I mean, this diamond, it's over a century old now. Right. But it still manages to just capture the imagination. Yeah. It really is a symbol entangled with history, politics. Yeah. You know, all the complexities of ownership. Absolutely. So let's go back in time. Okay. Back to 1905. All right. Picture yourself as a miner in the premier mine mm -hmm. in South Africa, just another day at work. Yeah. And bam. You find this giant diamond. Oh, wow. 3,106 carats. That's huge. I know, right? <laughs> Larger than a tennis ball. Wow. They call it the Cullinan. Okay. Named after the mine's chairman. Interesting. Thomas Cullinan. And and it wasn't just any diamond. Right. It was like super clear, super brilliant. Oh, so it was already kind of like right. showing its potential even back then. Exactly, yeah. It really kind of showed the world what South Africa had Yeah. in terms of mineral wealth right so the transvaal government okay that's the government in that region of south africa mm -hmm. they bought it smart One hundred and fifty thousand pounds yeah which is a lot of money oh yeah especially back then for sure yeah so even in its rough form right it was already super valuable yeah i mean financially but also symbolically right yeah and then get this they decided to give it as a gift oh wow to king edward the seventh of england in 1907 Interesting. I wonder what the thinking was there. Well, you know, probably diplomacy, a little bit of strategic maneuvering. It makes you think about the relationship between the two countries at the time. Yeah, definitely. But transporting that thing. Oh, I bet that was a challenge. It must have been. It was shipped to Amsterdam very carefully to the Asher Brothers. The Asher Brothers. You know, the diamond cutters. Oh, right. I've heard of them. They're like the best in the world. Yeah. Legendary. Absolute. So they were the ones who actually shaped the diamond. Yeah. So these guys... They were known for their amazing craftsmanship, like super precise right. and innovative cutting techniques. You know, they really understood how to make a diamond sparkle. Yeah. They knew how to maximize brilliance mm -hmm. and fire. Right. Like they were artists. Totally. Yeah. And so they took this massive diamond mm -hmm. and they studied it, planned every single cut. Wow. Carefully, I bet. So carefully. And they didn't just make one diamond. No. They made nine major stones really like almost a hundred smaller ones you've got to be kidding each one a masterpiece in itself that's incredible so out of this one big rough stone yeah they created all these amazing diamonds yes the most famous of course is the great star of africa ah uh, the star of the show i know right yeah so it's 530.2 carats huge seriously i know think bigger than a golf ball that's unbelievable. I know, right? It's actually the largest clear-cut diamond in the world. Wow. So that's where that record comes from. Yes. I mean, it's had so many names, right? It has. It has. Colin and one for Star of Africa. Star of Africa. Okay. Star of Africa. All very fitting. Each name kind of adding to its story. So where is it now? I have a guess. I bet you do. It's with the British Crown Jewels, isn't it? It is. Figured. Right in the heart of them. It's actually set in the Sovereign Scepter. Wow. Which is used during coronations and stuff. Oh. So you can just imagine this massive diamond yeah. on top of this golden scepter yeah. steeped in history. Oh, and the history is not over. No, it's not. We've got the second largest stone from the Cullinan, too. Oh, yeah. The lesser star of Africa. On the linen, too. Right. It's in the imperial state crown. Yeah. So from that one diamond in South Africa, right. these two stones became part of like the most important jewels for the british monarchy it's quite a journey it is i bet you're wondering how much it's worth well yeah i was just thinking that i mean we've talked about all this stuff. yeah the size the history the royalty well the estimates range from like 400 million dollars to 2 billion dollars wow that's that's hard to even comprehend i know it must be impossible to put an exact price tag on it i mean it's not just about the size and the quality but also the historical significance. Right. The cultural value, all the stories. You can't really put a price on that. No. But there's something else we need to talk about. Right. Something a little bit more complex. All right. 
there's this debate about whether the diamond was stolen from Africa. Oh, I've heard about this. It's a sensitive topic. Yeah, it is. It really raises the question, what does ownership even mean? Right. When we're talking about something with so much history and cultural significance. Absolutely. Like, who gets to decide who owns it? Exactly. And what does that ownership even mean? Exactly. So there's this organization, the Azanian People's Organization, or Azapo. Okay. And they say the diamond was basically taken from Africa. They believe it belongs to the people of South Africa. Right. That it was taken without proper compensation. Mm hmm But Buckingham Palace, they say that the Transvaal government bought it legally. Okay. And they gave it to King Edward as like a symbol of goodwill. Oh, I see. Between the nations. So you've got these two very different views. Two very different perspectives on the same event. Yeah. Both with their own arguments well, based on how they see the history. Exactly. Oh, and there's also this crazy legend. Oh, a legend. I love those. About how the diamond got to England. <sighs> they say Thomas Cullinan, the mine chairman, just mailed it. He mailed it. Like regular mail to King Edward. He put the world's largest diamond in the mail. That's what they say. I don't know about that. Even if the royal mail was good? I know, right? That seems a little risky. A little bit. Although, I'd love to see the insurance premiums on that package. Right. That would be something. But it's a fun story, right? Yeah. It just shows how fascinated people are with this diamond. It's a great story, blending history and politics and even a little bit of folklore. Totally. So, we've covered a lot of ground here. We have. From the mine in South Africa? Mm-hmm all the way to the crown jewels. Yeah, but there's always more to uncover, isn't there? There is, so what do you say we dig a little deeper? I'm ready if you are. Ah. <laughs> I think so. Yeah. I think we should look closer at some of the, you know, lesser known parts of the story. Right, like we've talked about the discovery, the sale, the royalty. Yeah, the big picture stuff. But what about the people? Right. Like the actual miners who found the diamond. Yeah, what about them? What were their lives like? I mean, can you imagine? It's hard to even imagine. All that work. The dust, the heat. Yeah, back-breaking labor. Yeah, and then suddenly this amazing gem... Yeah, disappears. ...changes their lives forever. Mm. It must have been incredible. And the Asher brothers, too. Oh, yeah, the cutters. Think of the pressure they were under. I know, right? To cut this diamond perfectly. A diamond that's worth, you know, millions or billions. Yeah, and so historically significant. I mean... They were real artists. True craftsmen. It had to study every detail. Every little imperfection. Yeah, and plan each cut so carefully. One wrong move. And Disaster. Exactly. It makes you wonder, you know, what they would think. Yeah. What would they say? If they could see the diamond today. If they knew its whole story. Yeah, their perspective would be so valuable. Yeah.